Hey there, interwebs. Yes, before we get started, this is a new haircut, and yes, I am slowly completing my transformation into Nurse Chapel from Strange New World. Anyways, moving on from that, as many of you know, my videos often take a lot of time and work to make. And I've got a bunch of huge videos coming, believe me. I'm got, I got some things coming that was meant to be a sexual joke and I, I ruined the timing on it. Anyways, I've got a lot of big videos coming. Yet, since hatred takes about the same amount of time as Matt Walsh puts into his beard grooming, there have been dozens upon hundreds of news updates about trans people lately surrounding anti-trans legislation, anti-trans events, positive events, and just many of the things going on in the United States and elsewhere surrounding transgender rights and issues that I really just haven't had the time to discuss on my channel. So I decided I wanna put on on my professional suit and uh, professional hair, I guess, because I want to go and quick touch upon a lot of these stories. Grandpa's feeling a little frisky today. Not just because I want to talk about them individually, but because I think that there is a larger thread and narrative that connects all of these things that I want to draw your attention to. Something hiding, making itself seem natural and normal, invisible to the eye, yet you can always hear it in the background. So, let's dive into all of these stories and see where the connections lie. And also, let's just talk about people being anti-trans assholes. Kind of do a bigot potpourri, as it were. It's less fun knowing that the confetti is made out of hatred. I think one got in my tea. Oh shit. <laughs> Fuck. Ow, that's hot! Fuck me. <laughs> But before we get started... Okay, thought that would be smoother. I honestly thought the carpet was gonna be the hard part about getting into place for this shot. <laughs> Hello everyone, before we get started on the video, however, I just want to share with you all something that I'm working on and am extremely excited and proud about. For? About. Proud, for, and excited about. Got it. Glad I scripted this part out! But as should be very clear, this video is going to be about a lot of the hate that trans people have been receiving lately, mainly here in the United States and the UK. But it's also really important during these hard times to recognize trans and queer joy. But on a personal level, I just wanted to share with you something that is giving me a lot of personal joy and excitement right now. And that is my upcoming film, Identities, the movie that I have written and am directing, and is a sci-fi story about how we all exist in systems that don't see us as full people, and how we can find joy in the fullness of who we are despite that, and how that joy in and of itself is what destroys these systems that try to press us all into common molds. It's a story about finding joy in a world that doesn't allow you to have that joy, and how that joy itself destroys those systems. It's a story that I really need to hear right now, which is why I'm trying to tell it so that I can watch it. But it's also a story that I'm committed not just to telling in front of the camera, but behind the scenes as well. Which is why I am so incredibly honored to have pulled together a, a truly amazing and diverse queer and women-led team alongside my producer, Dr. Aaron McDonald. Which includes, by the way, in front of the camera, Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube, Jessica Nicole from works such as Fringe and Underground, Maggie Mae Fish from here on YouTube, RuPaul Drag Race's Jackie Freaking Cox, queer comedian James Tyson, 4400's Ezra Reeves, and Star Trek's John Delancey. Yes, Q from Star Trek is going to be in a movie that I wrote. Honestly, it's been fucking wild. <laughs> And on top of all of that, one of the things that has been really meaningful to me is that this film is being distributed by the streaming service Nebula. And the fact that Nebula has been such an amazing partner in the entire creative process for this film. And I mean this incredibly earnestly because they did not ask me to say this, but I am saying this because despite funding this whole project, they have never once dictated my team's creativity but quite literally only worked to enable it. Like, I don't think I've ever heard of another group that has been so enabling of indie filmmakers such as me and my team as creators, queer folks, and human beings as Nebula is. And to be very clear, this is something they do all the time, 
on their streaming service itself because that streaming service is itself built by and for creators like me. Nebula hosts amazing work from diverse artists, has Nebula classes that help teach others how to do their own really creative work and, and bring that forward to new folks who want to get into being creators, and also funds projects not only like Identities, but Abigail Thorne's own The Prince, which is a transgender-focused Shakespeare multiverse film that I cannot recommend enough uh, and is on Nebula right for you now. I say this from my heart that Nebula is helping me and I know many other folks do their dream projects and, and, and making something happen in our lives that I, I am lucky to be getting at this stage in my career because it is really hard to come by and even more hard to come by as a trans creator. And so with all that said, I will say if you want to support me, if you want to support Identities, and you also want to support Nebula, you can sign up at the link below uh, to get a discount to sign up for Nebula, get yourself all the cool stuff that Nebula is doing, including Identities when it comes out. And on top of that, by signing up that link, it quite directly helps me and my team on Identities pay our bills while doing all of this stuff and shows Nebula that you want to support content like this. So with all that being said, thank you so much for sharing this joy that I have at making this project with such a diverse and talented team of people alongside Nebula. And with that said, let's suddenly get into the less fun discussion for the rest of this video. Speaking of paper thin egos that ruin the fun of rainbow colors, let's talk about the Montana Republican led state legislature and their treatment of their first openly transgender woman Montana state representative, Democrat Zoe Ziffer. On January 3rd, 2023, the Montana House introduced Senate Bill 99, one of the numerous bills that we've seen introduced around the United States in the past few years that would prohibit gender affirming care for transgender minors. Montana Republicans argued that this bill was merely protecting Montanan kids, the constant cry of, won't someone please think of the children? As they consistently ignore the words and needs of children. Children live under the guardianship of adults precisely because they lack the maturity prudence and experience to make safe, responsible decisions for themselves. As has been said numerous times on this channel and many, 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 many others, bills like this ignore the preponderance of evidence and guidance of medical officials and associations nationwide and worldwide by denying much needed medical care to transgender kids. Dozens of published studies have consistently found that gender affirming care leads to better mental health and happier life outcomes for transgender teens. And for at least one transgender person, leads to a happier life trying to endlessly pursue the ultimate goal of becoming a Star Trek character. Numerous major medical organizations, including the Endocrine Society, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Pediatrics, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and presumably numerous other medical organizations with acronyms that contain perhaps a few too many A's and P's have all affirmed these and released guidelines for trans care based on the continuing preponderance of scientific evidence that says transgender care is good actually. Yet these bills like Senate Bill 99 continually fearmonger to the constituents to try to get past the idea that gender affirming care means giving kids hormones like they're transgender M&Ms, or giving them body changing surgeries like they're taking the nuts out of peanut M&Ms, or vilify puberty blockers as unsafe drugs that turn your M&M child into a Skittle. Now I want M&Ms. Goddamn woke marketing. And this was again the case in Montana, where Senate Bill 99 proponents argue that they were protecting Montana children from permanent life altering medical procedures until they are adults mature enough to make such serious health decisions. It is our job as adults to give children the message that no matter how intense or difficult their feelings are, that they can work through them without dissociating from themselves to become a different person. That those who were attempting to give health care to these kids are just grooming children into a transgender and M&M lifestyle. Sorry, before we get much further, I have to try this. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, damn it. Oh. Oh, mom. Mm. Second try. Suck it, bigots. Bet you didn't expect that. A trans woman would be good at getting nuts in her mouth. Did not, did not think that through before I said it. Anyways, none of this is true. First off, we've seen how bills like this aren't just about kids. 
as in places like Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, South Carolina, Florida, and Texas have all moved to or have actually passed bills that increased the banned age of transgender affirming care to 26 or even beyond, showing that they don't care about protecting kids or even care about adults having bodily autonomy over their own medical choices, informed by their doctors and medical professionals. All they really care about is attacking trans healthcare in order to wipe up a culture war fervor in their bases and also controlling people's bodies using kids as the justification to start that process. Many transgender adults who have been living happily taking these healthcare treatment for years now have had to stop cold turkey, leaving them literally physically unwell and forced to find illegitimate means of getting their needed healthcare. Hello everybody, my name is Oliver. I'm a trans guy who is born and raised and currently living in Missouri. Um, and so this video is going to be an update of, since six days ago, the um, Attorney General issued a an emergency rule that is effectively going to remove access to care to a great number of trans people here in Missouri. Um, effective next Thursday on April 27th. Um, so obviously a lot of people are really scared, and this is very serious, and unfortunately we haven't had a lot of news coverage of it yet, and so I'm using my microscopic platform here to try to get information out to as many people as possible. So this- So not only is this a danger for many trans people seeking to even start their own healthcare, it is dangerous for people who are currently on trans-affirming healthcare. And let me tell you a related story of my own to kind of articulate to you how dangerous this can actually be, and mine is a rather mild case. While I've been very lucky that I've spent my post-coming out life living in New York, California, and Washington State, three states that have generally been good about transgender healthcare overall, I did deal with a situation where for two months a shortage of estrogen occurred. The distributor of the estrogen that I had been taking was unable to get new estrogen out to people and fulfill prescriptions for about two months or so. And as I had been taking estrogen for five years and had also had bottom surgery, not being able to access estrogen left me feeling incredibly weak, tired, angry, and physically unable to get around. My job performance plummeted, I was depressed, and I honestly just couldn't socialize. And that was for two months due to a simple shortage of the drug that I had been taking. Now imagine that shortage not being just something that happened, but actually being caused by the government in power, which obviously doesn't care to even learn about your healthcare needs, as this interview by an anti-trans Republican who voted for an anti-trans bill in a separate state, where she said she hadn't even looked up any of the research around transgender healthcare before voting on the bill shows, is there anything going on I should be aware of? Nebraskan Republican lawmaker Christy Armendariz asked. When reporter Shapiro explained that anti-trans bills were passing around the country, Armendariz responded, so is it a big widespread thing? I knocked doors for a year and nobody brought this up, she told Shapiro, explaining that everyday Nebraskans were not concerned with the issue and adding that she wished the bill had never been introduced. Armendariz also expressed confusion about the meaning of gender identity. She said trans issues reminded her of, quote, the huge backlash the country had several years ago about body image and how the airbrushed photos and the perfect body image really needs to go away and the real human needs to be shown. What happened to that philosophy, she asked. Shapiro tried to explain that gender dysphoria and body image issues were not the same, but Armendariz continued to conflate the two. When I was a teenager and I was going through a lot of trouble, my mom used to tell me, you can't run away from yourself. You're inside. Your head's always going to be the same. Shapiro then pointed out that cis women and teenage girls are allowed to get breast augmentation, trying to explain the hypocrisy of banning trans youth from doing the same. I don't have much breasts at all, she responded. You can probably tell I do not feel that way. Despite this lack of understanding, Armendariz voted in favor of the bill. And also imagine that you don't know when, if ever, you can get your needed medical supplies. It is absolutely gross, and it's one that leaves me absolutely terrified if any of these bills ever get enacted on a national level and makes me extremely pissed for any trans people living in these states. Further, it also should be said that kids seeking trans-affirming care are rarely, if ever, given surgeries, at least until they are of an age where they can give informed consent, and also have to spend a long time working with doctors, nurses, and their affirming guardians and therapists to even get on something like hormones. And most are sometimes 
sometimes given puberty blockers after also having to spend a long time working with professionals in order to determine if puberty blockers are right for them. And it also should be said that puberty blockers are safe drugs and often given to non-transgender kids and patients as well. These drugs have also been on and off used since the 1980s and there are several different types of these drugs that can be picked by doctors specific to each individual patient based on their needs. These aren't brand new drugs that just came out of nowhere but are things that have been used and studied for a very long time. But when it's for transgender kids, of course it's dangerous and not tested drugs that need to be stopped right now. Studies that have been done on this whatsoever. We've never, we've never had a generation of kids that, we, that, that has had this done to them. Like they're lab rats. So we're just kind of trying this out on a whole generation of kids. <laughs> On top of all of this, many medical professionals, if they are doing their job correctly in actually trying to give good trans-affirming care, work to see that each individual patient's needs in their specific situations are actually taken care of. And it should be noted that not all trans people, kids included, wish or desire any form of medical transition, but also should be given the right and time to figure that out working with medical professionals instead of having it decided for them by the government. Denying trans kids access to this much needed care not only leaves them unable to get needed medical treatment, but also has an emotional toll, making them feel alone, unwanted, and vilified, tossed aside by a society that's supposed to care for them, that likes to yell and scream about how they're caring for the children, but leaving them feeling like they are worth nothing. Not to mention the indirect effect of numerous trans kids not even living in these states who see people in power working to actively condemn them and deny their humanity. Leading a group already dealing with multiple attacks against our existence and individual acts of bigotry against us as well that leads to mental health distresses and potentially suicidal thoughts and actions, especially in transgender kids who are not able to have the tools necessary often to deal with many of these things that society is saying and telling them. Because of these bills and numerous others, transgender kids and adults are not being given proper medical care and many do die because of these direct and indirect actions. Your son, he died by suicide, but in the larger sense, what killed Henry? He gave up on the world. He gave up on finding his place in it. He gave up on being able to just find a lane that he could be in and not have to struggle. All of this is exactly why, in April 2023, transgender activist and Montana Democrat State Representative Zoe Zephyr spoke up about the issue related to Senate Bill 99 and stated plainly on the Montana House floor. And the only thing I will say is if, I, if you vote yes on this bill, and yes, on these amendments, I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. And this statement apparently caused an uproar in the Montana state legislature. Montana Republicans then banned Zoe from speaking on the floor, saying that she had... Actually, you know what? Instead of just having one of my friends read that quote, why don't we actually just hear the recording of these Montana Republicans talking about Zoe's words? Yeah, that sounds about right. A lot of pearl clutching. This behavior violated the collective rights and safety of 99 other members of this body, our staff, our pages, and the public. This unfair treatment of Zoe ultimately led to trans protesters showing up who were then forced out of the Montana building by police as Zoe held up her microphone in solidarity with them as they were being escorted out. After this situation, Montana's far-right Freedom Caucus, part of a nationwide network of right-wing state legislatures emulating the National House Freedom Caucus that formed after Kevin McCarthy's bid for U.S. House Speaker in order to get more right-wing concessions from him, wrote a letter to the Montana legislature that repeatedly misgendered and dehumanized Zoe asking for her removal from the House. The Freedom Caucus agreed with Majority Leader Sue Vinton when she immediately stood up to condemn Zoe's words to state, we can debate matters civilly and with respect for each other, while individual legislators have condemned his behavior. The legislature itself has not yet issued a collective statement acknowledging the wrongdoing and upholding a commitment to civil discourse. 
This kind of hateful rhetoric from an elected official is exactly why tragedies such as the Covenant Christian School shooting in Nashville occurred. <laughs> Later that week, the Montana legislator ultimately held the vote that forced Zoe off of the House floor until the next legislative session, meaning that Zoe could not speak or hear any of the debates on the bills for the entirety of the rest of her current term. Today, I rise in defense of those constituents, of my community, and of democracy itself. Last week, I spoke on the governor's amendments to Senate Bill 99, which banned gender-affirming care. This was a bill that was one of many targeting the LGBTQ community in Montana. This legislature has systematically attacked that community. We have seen bills targeting our art forms, our books, our history, and our health care. And I rose up in defense of my community that day, speaking to harms that these bills bring and that I have firsthand experience knowing about. I have had friends who have taken their lives because of these bills. I have fielded calls from families in Montana, including one family whose trans teenager attempted to take her life while watching a hearing on one of the anti-trans bills. And in that hearing, our caucus pleaded with the Republican chair of the Judiciary Committee to not allow certain testimony to keep decorum. And we were told a lot of people have a lot of opinions on these things. So when I rose up and said, there is blood on your hands, I was not being hyperbolic. I was speaking to the real consequences of the votes that we as legislators take in this body. It should be noted that someone saying someone has blood on their hands is not a wild or new phrase in political discourse. As the Associate Press noted, it's a phrase that's been used throughout U.S. history by numerous politicians, such as by Republican Lou Barlett, a Pennsylvanian congressman who used those exact words to attack the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania in 2021, where he then faced no backlash for using them. And these words themselves come from the Old Testament. Even Eminem Jesus would say, yo, this phrase is a bit cliche. Saying someone has blood on their hands aren't wild, unheard of, calling out words. They're actually a very polite way of saying, Yo! Fucking people are dying because of your actions, you horrific, ghoulish monsters! And even saying that is the polite way to say it, because if all you feel due to being insulated by your position of power are harsh words for your actions that are literally leading to people's deaths, you should feel lucky. Yet, the reason that Republican lawmakers, like Republican Representative John Fuller, who sponsored Senate Bill 99 and does indeed have blood on his hands now that the bill has signed into law, got so upset was that they were being confronted directly with the harm of their actions, something that had been made invisible to them by the system until Zoe said it to them. These lawmakers, when they sign these bills, don't have to look transgender people in the eye. They don't have to see the effects of these bills on the actual people that they are about. Also, because these lawmakers are voting from a station of privilege, they can each individually make themselves think that the bill passing is not their individual personal fault, and that because it passed through the hallowed halls of their system, it must have legitimacy or foundation or must be based in something factual. But the truth is, the system is not sacred or divine and does not dilute the real harm being done by said system. Zoe was confronting Montana Republicans with that very fact, with the image of genuine blood that they thought they could hide from themselves. And that is why they are upset. Because they are being forced to cope with the cognitive dissonance of not wanting to see themselves as bad people because they are contributing to harm that is intentionally made invisible to them, that they themselves have continually worked to insulate themselves from. So they instead yell at Zoe, the person pointing out their bigotry. And they are often the ones arguing that they're being oppressed, the ones being attacked, that their free speech or rights are being harmed. Yet it is not the calling out a bigotry that is the harm. It is the bigotry itself being perpetuated by said system and being perpetuated by those who try to wash their hands of culpability. The calls for civility on Zoe's part while she faces off against these bigoted ghouls while these same people dead name her and push her out of sight so they don't have to think about her being someone directly impacted by their actions as a trans person are hypocritical. Yet none of that is apparent because the system is meant to do this. 
to demand civility in the face of harm, while the system justifies the pain it causes and says that it itself is civil. The system is flawed. Like mm -hmm. that's that's the whole point. Like they say that the system it passed through the system, therefore it ought be right because it it went through the checks and balances. They like mm -hmm. to say, and the fact is the checks and balances are biased. Mm -hmm. Those very systems um, that allow for this bill to come through, it's mm -hmm. constructed to uphold the status quo. The further that harm is out of people's eyesights, the less that they have to think about it, and the more they can continue enacting it to justify their own power. Like, the civility aspect kind of facilitates um, the, the status quo and the nefarious things, and then they pass it off to be to do diligence of politics. So yeah. they're giving the, the illusion of politics. But how debate has been bastardized and just changed is that when people were debating in the days of yore in the polis, they weren't debating for entertainment or spectacle or to dunk on someone. They were doing it for the betterment of their society. And the civility in the days of the polis, the days of what we understand to be politics, is not what we're talking about right now. Mm. The civility is silence in many different ways in today's nomenclature of how um, we go about getting to the best the best um rule or chrissy you know like there's bureaucracy there's meritocracy like we're looking for the best chrissy the best way to govern and politics is the means to that end mm -hmm. but the whole point now is that we're not in a time of politics politics isn't being done you have folks that are trying to work in a system where there's a, of course, a great Audre Lorde quote, um, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what um, Zoe tried to do in this case. Like, uh, she's trying to work um, in that framework to bring about change. And the unfortunate part is that you can't. You can't use the master's tool to agitate for change because this exactly will happen. Mm -hmm. They will cite civility and say, what you're talking about is inappropriate. Zoe, to her credit though, set up shop right outside the house floor on a bench in order to be as close to where she can do her work as possible as well as to continually confront these house Republicans with the face of a person from the group that they have harmed. But even then, society works to push people out of view because a bunch of women allegedly came to sit on Zoe's bench to make her even more uncomfortable and push her off to the side. It shows how repeatedly trans people are not allowed to feel comfortable or safe in the same spaces that everyone else is simply because we speak up about how we are not being taken care of or given the same respect as everyone else. And thus, the cycle continues. The system was not made for us and does not wish to accommodate any marginalized person or group. When you mentioned exactly how civility uh, creates and engenders a very sterile environment that allows for the status quo to continue, to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, like immediately, like the political scientist in me is, is like John Locke, um, polite society, social, the social contract. Um, and the political theory has essentially allowed for what we know to be modern Western political discourse, the polis in general. Um, the same John Locke that created life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. <laughs> well, it's also too like the whole like uh, property and then change to happiness and how property is like equated to happiness in, in our society. So it's capitalist also. Yep, capitalist as well. And then also happens to be how we treated people as property too. Thing, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Like exactly that. Like property is the ultimate goal. So it's not only capitalist, but it's also the racial component in it provides for racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. The the fact that for a long time and to many people currently, I am not seen as my own autonomous being. I am seen as a piece of property to some people. Our country and the United States has a long history of punishing people who speak out against horrific systemic harm, such as things like slavery in supposed hallowed halls of our government. Take, for example, in 1856, when Senator Charles Schumer, I mean, Charles Sumner, <clears throat> I didn't misspeak at all when I was first recording this, an abolitionist against slavery, made a very long speech to argue for Kansas coming into the Union as a free state, thus allowing more anti-slavery senators to have power in the Senate, ultimately in the hopes of trying to outlaw slavery. Not in any common lust for power did this uncommon tragedy have its origin. 
It is the r of a virgin territory, compelling it to the hateful embrace of slavery. And it may be clearly traced to a depraved desire for a new slave state, hideous offspring of such a crime, in the hope of adding to the power of slavery in the national government. Sumner even went on in his speech to criticize pro-slavery senators and authors of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Andrew Butler and Stephen A. Douglas. The senator from South Carolina has read many books of chivalry and believes himself a chivalrous knight with sentiments of honor and courage. Of course, he has chosen a mistress to whom he has made his vows and who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him. Though polluted in the sight of the world, is chaste in his sight. I mean the harlot, slavery. For her, his tongue is always profuse in words. Let her be impeached in character, or any proposition made to shut her out from the extension of her wantonness, and no extravagance of manner or hardihood of assertion is then too great for this senator. The frenzy of Don Quixote on behalf of his wench, Dulcinea del Toboso, is all surpassed. Some very strong words, using the imagery of sexual violence to insult Butler, but to be fair, this was the language that senators used at the time in many ways. It is also important to note the sexual imagery that recurred throughout Sumner's oration, which was neither accidental nor without precedent. Abolitionists routinely accused slaveholders of maintaining slavery so they could engage in forcible sexual relations with their slaves. And not to mention, again, Butler, the person that Charles was criticizing, was supporting the horrific system of slavery, which was still allowed in the United States at the time. But it was a horrific system that was made to appear justifiable by being built into the American system right from its start, even in its constitution. It was made to seem natural and normal, the horrific white supremacist brutal system that our country had been built upon. Butler spoke to his cousin Preston Brooks, who said that this speech made Sumner no gentleman and meant he did not merit honorable treatment. Butler said that Sumner wasn't being civil. Two days later, Butler beat Sumner with a cane nearly to death in front of numerous other senators. According to Brooks, Sumner bellowed like a calf, and Butler was only stopped when another senator intervened. As a result of the brutal beating, Sumner suffered head trauma, a traumatic brain injury, and severe pain for the rest of his life. And both Butler and Sumner became martyrs for their sides of the Civil War. Despite Butler's horrific actions, as well as his support of a horrific system that had been made invisible, Sumner was still deemed the one in the wrong by the South because he had broken decorum, had spoken up about something that the South saw as natural and normal, slavery. And this call for civility in the face of horrific systemic harm isn't just confined to the past or to transgender people today. For example, Tennessee's Republican House expelled two black lawmakers, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, who spoke out in a similar situation for gun reform in that state in 2023. Just because you don't get your way, you can't come to the well, bring your friends, and throw a temper tantrum with an adolescent bullhorn. Yet at the same time that these two lawmakers were pushed out of the Tennessee House, a third lawmaker, who did the exact same things as Jones and Pearson, a white woman named Gloria Johnson, was not voted out. And the reason for the difference in the treatment between the two black men and the white woman couldn't be more obvious. Why do you feel like there was a difference in the outcome? Hey. I will answer your question. It might have to do with the color of our skin. Black men in the U.S. are often seen as inherently more aggressive and dehumanized through the lens of always being angry and dangerous, built upon the very foundations of ways that black men were dehumanized during the system of slavery in the United States. Thus, despite doing these same actions as Gloria Johnson, these two black men's actions were seen as more direct and violent by the Republican-led House. As shocking as these expulsions were to many, America has a long history of removing black lawmakers from office quelling dissent and subverting the will of the voters, all for the sake of raw power, resisting demographic change, and maintaining white dominance through anti-democratic and dictatorial means. In Georgia, 33 black lawmakers were expelled from the General Assembly for being black. White Democrats in control of the assembly declared that the 1868 election won by Republican Governor Rufus Bullock was fraudulent and illegitimate, and that the new state constitution did not grant the black legislators the right to hold office. They further argued that formerly enslaved black people had no right to vote. Across many states, white supremacists ushered in the end of black elected representation through Jim Crow authoritarianism. In majority black Mississippi, 
the 1890 Constitutional Convention, of which 133 of 134 delegates were white, adopted a new state constitution with a poll tax and literacy test designed to disenfranchise black voters. Black people have not held elected office statewide in Mississippi since 1890. The Republicans in the Tennessee House's actions towards these two black men had racist biases and was meant in the same way that Zoe was pushed out by the Montana House to push out black voices from being heard because they were calling out how these Republicans' actions, or lack thereof, on gun reform continually led for more and more harm. There's something in the decorum of this body that says it's okay to call that a temper tantrum, to call people we disagree with on the issues, to say that all they want is attention. But I'll tell you what, I don't personally want attention. What I want is attention on the issue of gun violence. But instead, we're here with the resolution you put up talking about expelling me for advocating for ending gun violence in the state of Tennessee. Yet these Republican lawmakers, again, like to clutch their pearls when they were called out for their racist biases, even though they don't mind doing the racist stuff. As we have a recording of these Tennessee Republicans complaining about being called racist and then immediately proceeding to talk about their racist actions. Can we play that clip, please? <laughs> oh, no, sorry, not that one. This one. I think now, more than ever, everyone should recognize that Democrats are not our friends. I listened for the last three days to Democrats, Sam McKenzie, the Chisholm, yeah. Parkinson, trash us as racists. I've never had anybody call me a racist. And for the last three days, all I have heard from them is how this is the most racist place for a white, one of these white supremacists. Good Lord, we have to realize they are not our friends. They can smile, man, that doesn't mean I can't be polite to them, but they are not our friends. Exactly. They destroy the republic and the foundation of who we are or we preserve it. That is the reality where we are right now. And if these last three days have not proven that, we need to find a new job. There has never been a more important time for us to be unified. There are 75 of us. Let them call their name of the names they're going to call. Them. We need to move forward. We need to pass the gun bill. We need to pass the pronoun bill, wherever Mark is. Man, we do not slow down because of their crap. We can't. Again, these lawmakers call for civility on the part of two black men speaking out about how the system harms people, yet they themselves don't act civilly to the marginalized voices because these Republicans can put their actions upon the system that ultimately justifies itself and its own harm. All of this speaks to how, in our society, it is worse to be called a racist than to actually be a racist. How it is worse to be called an anti-trans bigot than it is to actually be and do anti-trans bigoted actions. It is worse in our society to be called homophobic than it is to actually be homophobic. Even nowadays, like in the most progressive of settings, I am still a property in a regard where I like it, like the viewer, I like it when my prop, like when you say these things that affirm my progressive worldviews. I don't like it when you talk about like how I might very well be, you know, um, racist or like I might have my transgressions or when I say mm -hmm. things in a particular light. Um, and that's when you put the property down. That's when you turn the property off. And it's different ways of which we're commodified and limited um, as black folks and just marginalized folks in general. This extends beyond just the racial component. It also um, affects like cis and trans women, women in general, women and femmes any like POC of all kinds. Mm -hmm. The reason is that racism, anti-transness, homophobia, and much more is built into the system itself. These things are made invisible by our world, built to accommodate those in power who don't have to look at those they harm. And them being called out as what they are exposes the truth of the situation. And so many throw their anger at those calling them out because they don't wish to wrestle cognitively with the thing that the system has hidden from them. Or they don't wish to be seen by their constituents as the things that they know that they are. And the harm that they are able to continue causing and repeating. Given the dominant conceptualization of racism as individual acts of cruelty instead of things that people can contribute to unknowingly, it follows that only terrible people who consciously don't like people of color can enact racism. Though this conceptualization is misinformed, it is not benign. In fact, it functions beautifully to make it nearly impossible to engage in the necessary dialogue and self-reflection that can lead to change. Outrage at the suggestion of racism is often followed by righteous indignation about the manner in which the feedback was given. 
Just because you don't get your way, you can't come to the well, bring your friends, and throw a temper tantrum with an adolescent bullhorn. While that quote that was just read is about racism, it should be noted that many of the other bigotries and discriminations built into our system stem from the attempt to create a system of pseudoscience and systemic justifications for racism and things like patriarchy that ultimately end up including things like anti-transness, which itself stems from gender norms created to justify slavery. As a result, that quote that was just read can easily apply to things like anti-transness. How many trans people or marginalized groups when we speak up about issues related to how we are affected by things are end up seen as bullies, vilified, are told that we are making ourselves and our communities look bad. It happens over and over and over again, especially as these bigotries continue to build as fascism rises in the United States. Building itself up upon the idea of a gender norm that is being eroded by the different marginalized groups. I can certainly very much relate to this. I think many trans people or marginalized person can, especially in the past few years. It's honestly been really hard these past few months for me personally, having to deal with things from JK Rowling to Hogwarts Legacy to Twitter drama, having to constantly see people intentionally removing context from my words constantly over and over again. Words that were calling out how the system harms other trans people and me by making itself invisible. And it's honestly, deeply demoralizing some days. How when trans people are dying, we can't, I can't even talk about how we are dying without being misinformed about, disinformed about, and attacked, and harmed, and dehumanized. Sorry, got dark there for a moment. Happy Jesse says, let's move on to the next story, cause speaking of creating false scientific justifications for bigotry, let's talk about an organization doing just that. The American College of Pediatrics, a group that seemingly is trying to make itself sound professional and legitimate by adding A's and P's to its acronym, recently left a link to a Google Drive unsecured on their website, letting sensitive documents, including tax and financial records, as well as membership roles, releasable to the public. This is why you never leave things that you don't want people to see on a Google Drive. You hide that within a folder, within a folder, within a folder, within a folder, within your documents folder on your desktop, man. Shit. But more importantly for us though, there were also email exchanges spanning over a decade found in that Google Drive made by the American College of Pediatrics, which were then reviewed by Wired, where most of this section's reporting comes from, by the way. The college, which by the way is as much a college as PragerU is an actual university or Matt Walsh's beard is an actual good beard, has long been called out for its harm. The organization has tried to remove kids from LGBTQ couples, treated LGBTQ kids in school as mentally ill, and has also been a leading think tank in attacking abortion rights, with an anti-abortion lawsuit started by the group even currently going all the way to the Supreme Court. Due to all of this and numerous other things, the Southern Poverty Law Center declared the college a hate group due to its attempt to mainstream harmful beliefs into the public. And according to the email leaks, it's tried to do these things in numerous ways. The college's express goal was to return to a mythical great American past where things align more with their view of the social mores around the nuclear straight heterosexual family, what with their man, woman, and 2.5 kids, as well as laws that were centered around evangelical Christian beliefs. In order to do this, the college targeted 10,000 mailers at conservative physicians between the years 2013 and 2017 alone. The college also lobbied and sent educational resources to physicians and med school students, which included directions on how to speak to children about sex, especially in the absence of their parents. These educational materials would include practice scripts on how to get kids to talk about their thoughts on sex through metaphors. These scripts would also instruct physicians to then paint same-sex marriage as aberrant and abnormal. These mailers also told parents if they thought their kid might have expressed some LGBTQ thoughts to make a special overnight trip and buy an expensive $54 kit online that the college sells for no apparent reason, full of games that help children and parents learn the concept of sexual purity. Speaking of which, the college also told adults to talk to kids without their parents there, getting information from the kids about their parents and then tell them that open-mindedness about LGBTQ people is gross and abnormal and disgusting. The college also created handouts for physicians to give to kids' parents on how to affirm masculinity in boys and femininity in girls, often reinforcing women's roles as submissive and subordinate to a father and men as needing to be dominant and often overprotective of young girls. 
affirming your daughter's and son's sexual identity. One, boys have a biological destiny to grow into men, men who are different from women in ways that go well beyond genetic design and reproductive functions. Similarly, girls have a biological destiny to grow into women. Two, societal structures have always existed to guide the process of growth from boyhood to manhood and from girlhood to womanhood. Settings or actions that can disrupt the natural gender identity process. A dominant, excessively critical or controlling mother. A mother who is overly critical of the father or other males can negatively influence a daughter's relationship with men or a son's perception of his own masculinity. A mother who lacks an intimate, satisfying relationship with the father and instead prolongs her attachment to her son, seeking to fulfill her need for love and companionship through her son. Mothers should not favor a son over his father, even if the son is more responsive and compassionate than the husband. If mothers make this mistake, The son may identify with the mother and fail to bond with the father. Fathers, wrestle on the floor with your son. Play tackle and praise him for being tough when he is knocked down. As you play, always be sure to tune in to your son's cues. If he's not enjoying playing rough together, then it is important to tone it down and play in a way that he enjoys. The goal is for your son to have fun playing with you. Go on man-time dates for breakfast or lunch. Talk about his strong muscles, fast running, and quick thinking. It's really interesting how all the stuff for mothers is prescriptive. Like, this is all the things mothers do wrong. And then going, here's the stuff that fathers can do right. It's very telling that all the, in, that all the advice for mothers is, is given in the negative and for fathers in the positive. Despite the fact that the description of how fathers should bond with their sons is already super fucking creepy. Like, that's really creepy. That's really fucking creepy, man. Ugh. They tell us to stay away from kids. Jesus. If all of that sounds fucked up to you, that's cause it is. If we're talking about grooming children into someone's ideology, uh, I, I don't think you get more blatant than this. Oh, and also while they're doing this, they constantly told people and adults to spend more money at the college. You gotta buy that $54 kit, you see. Even more pointedly, while the college has attacked women's bodily autonomy rights, as well as LGBTQ rights generally, the college's focus in the past few years has been exclusively on trans people. The group told parents, despite other medical groups saying otherwise, as we spoke about before, to not believe that their child is transgender, and to try to send them, if they thought that their kids were expressing transgender feelings, to Christian camps in order to convert them. So, conversion therapy. Avoid gender therapists, gender affirming therapists, LGBT affirming therapists, and gender clinics. These are all titles of therapists who seek to validate and affirm your child's gender disturbance as normal. The college also told parents that anime was making boys into girls. Perhaps the ring the prince gave her was an engagement ring. This was all well and good, but so impressed was she by him that the princess vowed to become a prince herself one day. But was that really such a good idea? (laughs) Which not only pushes the idea that transgender people are a social contagion, which is actively dehumanizing to trans people that exist, but also expresses that through xenophobia of Japanese culture. 
Similar rhetoric around the social contagion of trans people and the control of transgender kids' bodies is rhetoric you often see in many anti-transgender spaces, something that was chronicled by my friend Kaylee Conrad in her excellent video, where she went into many anti-transgender message boards and groups in order to understand and discuss how they think about and try to attempt to talk about transgender people. And she also discussed how pushing parents to not believe or at least let their children explore their gender contributes directly to mental health harm. It's not how this works. At the end of this road you're on, one way or another, if your child is trans, you are going to lose them. Maybe even if they aren't. They will find a way to get away from you eventually, regardless of the price they pay. You will never understand the consuming agony of that isolation. You will never recognize the absolute devastation you brought down on your child. And when they get away from you, when they leave one day and never speak to you again, that's going to be entirely, without question, your fucking fault. All of this echoes the actions of many anti-transgender parents who attempt to control their children through healthcare, such as how many anti-trans parents will deny their children access to much needed healthcare even outside of transgender related care, even into adulthood, if they seek to get transgender care. Take these examples that Kaylee and Conrad found in her video. I opened an EOB today from our insurance and found out that my daughter is using our insurance to pay for her PP visits for testosterone. My gut reaction is to pull her from the insurance. If she wants to ruin herself, she can pay for it herself. Furthermore, on top of all of this, the College of American Pediatrics also pushed the idea of rapid onset gender dysphoria. ROGD is a junk science theory that argues that culture, trans influences online, like myself, or many of children's peers are making kids spontaneously turn transgender as a type of social fad. Again, the idea of a social contagion of transgender people. You heard of this problem, you knew of people that their children were going through this, and how long did it take you before you decided to commit to pen to paper on this? So I, I spent a, maybe a month or so just hearing the reports of the parents and reading the original study. There's an original study that the book is, you know, ju jumps off from, which is the Lisa Littman paper at Brown University, she's a public health researcher who looked into this, and she found that there was all of a sudden this huge epidemic in America um, of teenage girls deciding they were trans with their friends after social media emerge in and, and pushing for hormones and surgeries. Again, this theory is bunk as it was created by a research paper in 2017 by Lisa Lightman, which concluded in the paper that ROGD was actually real, but was confirmed based solely on surveying only blogs run by parents already worried that their children were turning transgender. So the survey was very much begging the question. Many organizations widely criticized the paper. We did not find support within a clinical population for a new etiologic phenomenon of rapid onset gender dysphoria during adolescence. Among adolescents under age 16 years seen in specialized gender clinics, associations between more recent gender knowledge and factors hypothesized to be involved in rapid onset gender dysphoria were either not statistically significant or were in the opposite direction to what would be hypothesized. This putative phenomenon was posited based on survey data from a convenient sample of parents recruited from websites and may represent the perceptions or experiences of those parents rather than of adolescents, particularly those who may enter into clinical care. Similar analysis should be replicated using additional clinical and community data sources. Our finding of lower anxiety severity slash impairment scores in adolescents with more recent gender knowledge suggests the potential for long-standing experiences of gender dysphoria or their social complications playing a role in development of anxiety, which could also be explored in future research. But since it was published in a very professional magazine, a very civil magazine, that study has then been used to legitimize this idea over and over and over again, such as through the American College of Pediatrics, which used the study to continually push this idea of ROGD to parents that it was trying to market itself to. All of this, again, is the system ending up justifying itself and making invisible its harm. But none of this information that I'm telling you right now should be new to any of you, because I already did a video on ROGD, like, two years ago. Like ROGD has been debunked for a long time, and yet it still keeps coming back like new seasons of Kitchen Nightmares. Yet 
This is a tale as old as colonialism, because this style of justifying bigotry through bunk science is much older than ROGD. We can go a long, long way back, with a history of pseudoscience being used to justify prejudice and control of people's bodies, not the other way around as it tries to make itself seem. My friend and the wonderful Lily Alexander covered this in greater detail in her video, What Are Women?, that I extremely recommend that you go and check out. But to briefly summarize some of her points, while there have always been gender roles within any society, many cultures also had numerous gender roles beyond the idea of simply a man and a woman. To name a few, Jewish rabbis note that Judaism recognized six to eight genders. In the Mexican state of Oaxacana, people called muxes are an accepted third gender within that culture. There are also two-spirit indigenous folks, or how the Bujis people in Sulawesi recognize five genders. Each and every culture has had its own understanding of gender and how people related to it and the roles in which it played in their society. But in Europe, this generally, and I emphasize the word generally, developed into the binary gender roles of man and woman. In Europe, as communal property shrunk in favor of amassing private property hoarded by those in power, men were placed as the head of monogamous families in order to make it clear that his children were his own and thus could then inherit his property. Women, therefore, in this arrangement had to be controlled to limit the chances of having more children with other men. Thus, this system confined them to fewer external connections, leaving them at home to then take care of said children. So this whole system grew out of this idea of private property and control that then centered this power within men and male lineages. As the centuries went by and European powers grew and colonialization efforts took hold, these colonialist powers then colonized many other groups and also specifically tried to enslave black people in Africa in order to further propagate each individual nation's resources by creating a forced labor population and then also extracting the resources and people from the lands of Africa as well as the Americas where they had set up the slave trade in order to bring that labor force to America. To do all of this, those enacting this horrific system needed to justify slavery as natural, lest it be seen as the actual horrific, disgusting thing that it was to do. They understood that they needed to make the system itself seem civil and natural and just the way things are. As a result, pseudosciences like phrenology were created to justify black folks as subhuman. And one way these pseudoscientific justifications were set up was through gender roles. But the European idea of womanhood as being in the home wouldn't necessarily map onto black labor forces, as Europeans definitely did not want their labor force at home, but out in the fields working. So they instead framed black women as less human, feral, aggressive, and less overall womanly compared to white European women. Historically, the characterization of white European female as fragile and sexually passive opposed them to non-white colonized women including female slaves, who were characterized along a gamut of sexual aggression and perversion, and as strong enough to do any sort of labor. White women were seen as needing to stay at home and be protected, while white men went out and earned things and tried to generate more private property for themselves, while black folks, both men and women, were seen as aggressive and animalistic and therefore justified to be used to then build as a labor force to build that private property for those in power. Black womanhood then was seen as less than and used to make white European women look more delicate and in needing of protection, and thereby justifying the idea of womanhood as centered upon the white European ideal of womanhood. For example, black slave women were not seen as fragile or weak as white women were, but capable of doing intense labor, as we can see in this quote from the Antebellum South. First came, led by an old driver carrying a whip, Forty of the largest and strongest women I ever saw together. They were all in a simple uniform dress of a bluish check stuff, the skirts reaching 204 Hypatia a little below the knee. Their legs and feet were bare, they carried themselves loftily, each having a hoe over the shoulder and walking with a free, powerful swing, like chasseurs on the march. Behind came the cavalry, thirty strong, mostly men, but a few of them women, two of whom rode astride on the plow mules. A lean and vigilant white overseer on a brisk pony brought up the rear. The hands are required to be in the cotton field as soon as it is light in the morning, and with the exception of 10 or 15 minutes, which is given to them at noon to swallow their allowance of cold bacon, they are not permitted to be a moment idle until it is too dark to see, and when the moon is full, they oftentimes labor till the middle of the night. 
Thus, these gender roles were used to justify the system of slavery, alongside many other student scientific justifications, by ensconcing itself into the culture that we still see vestiges of in our society today. Black men are still seen as more aggressive. Black women's womanhood is seen as less womanly. For a long time, before the transatlantic slavery, um, slave trade, uh, a lot of white folks admired and extolled and lionized uh, fat. They mm -hmm. extolled being jolly and having weight on them. It's a sign of wealth. It's a sign of opulence. You look at your kings. And these folks were, they were hefty people. Yeah. Until they found out when they began to bring copious amounts of slaves that, oh, these black slaves, they also have weight on them too. Not all of them, of course, but some of them are just as, as hefty, if not more. How do we reconcile with this idea that um, black, flo black folks can be fat, black folks can have weight, and also weight and fat being a sign of wealth mm -hmm. when we're supposed to be subjugating them as white people. Yeah. So that had the campaign that essentially resulted in this whole multi-level propaganda where folks, where, where like um, health physicians and doctors and medicines and um, tabloid um, news journalists, yellow journalists, Everybody just like created this this um campaign to basically say that oh no fat is actually a sign of of moral degritude of low intelligence IQ of course being one of the big qualifiers of of intelligence when we know also very putting much it on a, like individual self too is like you can just pull your, you can make yourself thin yeah mm -hmm. and 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 that of course having a lot of harm for for folks even even white folks. And so this system of creating pseudo-scientific justifications not only builds itself upon specific gender roles that came out of imperialism, but the system continually tries to create further and further justifications to try to further and further its own harm. Once upon a time, in the 19th or early 20th century, race science was just science. It was very widely accepted that races exist biologically, that possibly we are different species or different breeds as human beings, that there might be a racial hierarchy between us. After the Second World War, when we saw eugenics play out, saw the consequences of Nazi racial hygiene in the Holocaust, the world kind of took a collective intake of breath and tried to put its house in order. So scientists, policymakers, the United Nations all came together and decided race has no play in biology anymore. It's not scientifically accurate. Race is not how differences play out in the real world. But there were two problems with this. Number one was the hardcore scientific racists. This includes Nazi race scientists. So the ones who believed that whites were superior, that slavery was justified, that segregation was justified. They kept scientific racism alive within a small but very active global network. The other aspect is mainstream science. Did everyday scientists really abandon these ideas completely? My argument is no. They clung on to them partly because, of course, racism was still there in society. We still had racism all around the world. Discrimination embedded in the structure of institutions. And that means even to this day, there are still scientists who, despite knowing better, and despite being mainstream, good-hearted, well-intentioned scientists, still sometimes invoke race in scientific research, particularly medical research, when it's appropriate. We see this plainly in transgender discussions going on today. Going back to the American College of Pediatrics, it was also recently discovered that the far-right law firm Alliance Defending Freedom offered the college $15,000 to refute the WPATH standards of care, which are the guidelines that most trans-affirming doctors use in order to guide them in how to treat trans people. Basically, what this means is that the Alliance Defending Freedom asked the college to come up with some medical sounding nonsense in order to give themselves credence to discredit transgender health care in the court of law. Just as pseudoscience was created to justify racism and slavery, not vice versa, so too has pseudoscience been created to justify anti-trans bigotry. Yet all of this also importantly points out how race science and anti-trans bigotry overlap, considering that they come from the same source of trying to create gender hierarchies in order to justify racism and systems of enslaving people. Race and gender have also combined to change the way American society views certain men. Black men are often viewed as hyper-aggressive 
While aggressiveness is typically valued in men, this belief that black men go beyond what is expected of white men in terms of aggressiveness means that society still does not believe they are upholding the quote, ideal for men. This can also be seen in a historical example of what occurred when large number of Chinese men immigrated to California in the 1800s. Anti-Asian racism grew because white men feared Chinese men would take their jobs and marry the limited number of white women in the area. This racism was institutionalized when white lawmakers made it mandatory to pay a fee to gain a gold miner's license and marriage between Chinese men and white women became illegal. It also led to the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first anti-immigration law in the United States which suspended Chinese immigration for 10 years. This targeted racism against Chinese men relegated them to the few jobs available to them, such as restaurant or laundry work, both of which are traditionally feminized. This prejudice also deemed them romantically undesirable. These institutional regulations led to the racist and sexist belief that Asian men are not the ideal job-earning aggressive white man. In these examples, racism and sexism worked in tandem to degender men and women of color. Because gender has been deemed a crucial social structure, this act of discrimination through degendering is a way of dehumanizing people of color. Many people of color have been forced into gender nonconformity, which is highly stigmatized in American society. People of color who are not cisgender, those who are either transgender or non-binary, face especially harsh discrimination for not performing gender according to society's expectations. They are more likely to experience exclusion from public spaces in the workforce and extreme violence, most commonly perpetrated against black transgender women. Uh, it goes back to this discussion uh, that black folks know very too well, is it's um, respectability politics. Mm, um, yeah, essentially yeah. saying that if we just pull up our pants, if we just speak properly, had we just stopped running in the streets with guns and um, procreating uh, children that we won't be fathers to, maybe the black community will get ahead in American society because America is is the land of of milk and honey and you should be able to make of yourself whatever you want uh you could be an immigrant and come there and be a millionaire in you know through hard work labor and uh you know pursuit of property so mm -hmm. the idea being that a lot of folks bought into that black conservatism is built on this respectability politic myth there's no amount of hands pulling and labor and bad haircuts and speaking, enunciating and over enunciating every word until everything sounds like you're literally from Turf Island, AKA the United Kingdom. It does not matter. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, there are a great amount of folks that will see nothing but a black person and immediately equate that with what proponents of race science um and i put science in quotation marks because yeah. it is far from that yes um and it's basically that they will see nothing more than the skull that is supposed to be uh subhuman the phenotype because uh, i hate that word in itself but like yeah. the the body types um the 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 curvatures that are only um, appropriate for a slave, the slave coating of curvature, the strong back, you know, like the thick legs that are built for only curing. For labor, for work, they're more, yeah, sub, again, subhuman, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that is, it, it's like, yet again, like you're talking about a system and this is a, yet another one. Like the way that we view our bodies is also an effort to create a hierarchy that allows for certain things to pass through that system mm -hmm. and certain things to be propelled by that system. And of course, in order to do that at scale, you need to denigrate, you need to subjugate another um, class of folks. You get no type of immense wealth, prosperity, riches, and social status. You don't get that by not exploiting a class of people. And the class of people that were historically uh, uh, were historically exploited were black folks. Yeah, and thus we can clearly see how these sciences ultimately not only uphold a version of womanhood, but a specific version of white womanhood that is centered in these past ideas of European white women as needing to be protected and stay at home. Take, for example, when sports organizations try to limit transgender women from competing using things like testosterone levels, it also forces black women, trans and cis, out of those same sports fields because the science they're using is based on the assumption of womanhood being centered in white European health standards. 
Christine Mboma and Beatrice Masalingi became the latest Black women athletes ruled ineligible to compete in a race at the Tokyo Olympics due to naturally high testosterone levels. The 18-year-old Nambian sprinters were tested during a medical assessment, and their levels exceeded the limit by a World Athletics Policy on Athletes with Differences of Sex Development (DSD), according to the Nambia National Olympic Committee and Commonwealth Games Association. The global governing body requires that female athletes' blood testosterone levels be under 5 nanomoles per liter to compete in select women's events, including the 400 meters. Hell, this is why we segregate sports along the lines of man and woman in the first place, rather than something that would make sense like weight class or something for each sport, because the idea of men being strong and being able to beat women consistently has been so ingrained as natural in our society. Collegiate sports were built by men, for men and boys in the early 1900s, as an area for promoting traditional ideas of masculinity. Competitive sports used battle terminology and focused on aggression to keep studious men from going soft. So many athletes died that an organization was created to protect the health and well-being of collegiate athletes. The organization is the NCAA, now a behemoth with over a billion dollars in annual revenue. Protecting student athletes is technically still its purpose, though it was failing to do this for women. The NCAA does not have any female-specific policies or best practices for the issues that disproportionately befall them within the collegiate sporting environment. At least, none that I could find. Or you can see it in how often the worrying around kids being turned trans is focused mainly on white trans men, who many anti-trans folks see as young white women needing to be protected. Even more so, you'll often see rhetoric that focuses around trans men focus on their loss of their ability to reproduce, and often specifically white trans men. Which again goes back to this focus on breeding and the ownership of women's reproductive systems, with trans men being seen as women in this case, which they are not. They perform double mastectomies on minor girls, on children. They chemically castrate children, and they give them irreversible hormone drugs. And instead see trans women, who they see as men, as aggressive, animalistic, sexual perverts. And believe me, I have gotten that numerous times. And I am a sexual pervert, but not because I'm trans. There were whole slave farms. Farms dedicated to re- I hate this word. Reading! Breeding black women to produce particular bodies, black bodies, of course, whether it is a white man um, having sex with them, but more, more often, let's just talk about like the black male slaves having sex with the black female slaves. There were whole, you know, crops like regular sugar cane. They had, sugar, imagine like a sugar cane crop here. Um, uh, I don't know, a bamboo crop here. And then you got a slave farm smack dab in the middle with just black slaves having sex with the sole purpose of producing more labor for the white man master. Mm -hmm. I, and like, it's, it just amazes me that someone could even come to this discussion about whiteness being this concept of civility, of, of, of um, safety. Like they see it as like this, this sign of prosperity. Uh, they often argue that black men marry into whiteness in order to gain more social um, climbing, which is true. Like this is like something that black people have bought into too. This idea that whiteness will save you. And the fact is it will not. Mm -hmm. In fact, it has subjugated you in many different cases. Like I said, the slave farms, <laughs> think about how fucked up it is that like a white slave master, white man can literally um, his property because there's property at that time. Black women were un you could not rape a black woman because they were property. You can't, you can do whatever you want with your property. So it's not a white slave master can rape his property. And then that rape will literally result in more profit because that is labor. Think about how fucked up that is. Not only That's do you not get really... penalized for it, because I mean, the, the no, first... it's encouraged. It's actually encouraged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, better for, it's better for business. But all of this is why it's important to note that while white transgender people and white trans women like myself are most certainly harmed by anti-trans bigotry, we are not the main targets of it. It's the same thing with many upper class cisgender white women. The systems that we have built do damage them for sure because white cisgender upper class women are seen as secondary to white men and needing to be controlled and stay at home. 
but it is the numerous black and indigenous and other BIPOC folks who are the primary victims and sufferers of these same issues. The ones who are killed disproportionately over and over and over and over and over again. Sorry, we got way off track. Um, American College of Pediatrics, bad. You know what? I'm sorry. Uh, you know what'll help? Let's let's do another story. A Nebraskan state senator, Megan Hunt, has recently been made the subject of an ethics violation case because of claims that she would benefit financially from an anti-trans health care bill not passing because she has a transgender son. Yeah, so apparently, Senator Megan Hunt spoke up during a debate on Legislative Bill 574, which would ban gender-affirming care for trans youth. Yeah, it's yet another one of those bills. And while arguing against it, she happened to mention that she was unable to get coverage for her son's transgender-related care under Medicaid currently, as it's not covered under Nebraskan law. And in response to this mention, Omaha lawyer David Begley filed an ethics complaint against her, saying that if the bill was defeated, it would make it easier for Hunt to get health care for her son. Thus, she would financially benefit from that. Therefore, it breaks her ethics as a lawmaker. <laughs> oh, I have thoughts. I have so many thoughts. What little is left of my hair is about to come out here because, okay, first off, if the bill gets passed, then nothing changes. So, <laughs> she wouldn't benefit financially. She would be in the same position she's currently in, which is the fact that she's unable to get health care for her son. So there's that element of it, but it's also, even if it doesn't pass, not financially benefiting if you're just trying to get your child health care. The fact that we have to pay so much for health care in this country at all for any group is horrific in the first place. The fact that health care for marginalized people, every marginalized person, not just trans people, is often so much more expensive and often so much worse or gatekept is even more horrid. And to attack someone trying to just stave off the further erosion of her child's rights to just be treated as a human being from a system that's meant to keep us alive and care for you as a human being is absolutely fucking gross. <sighs> professional, professional. I am a professional YouTuber. Some of Hunt's colleagues stood up for her saying, Family is off limits. I do not endorse this offensive complaint. It is so far out of bounds that it does not merit discussion. And I do agree. Thank you, Republican, for saying that. Family is off limits. So why are you legislating against her child and other trans children to begin with, Tom? Huh, Tom? If family is off limits, why the hell are you doing something that would affect the families of numerous trans people? You know what? In the words of Hunt herself... My colleagues stood up offering support. But I don't need their words. I need their vote. My child needs their vote. Children and families from across our state need their votes. Words are meaningless unless we put action behind them. I will continue to advocate for our kids, yours, theirs, and mine, no matter what harassment or intimidation comes my way. All of these things are, are leaning on created standards for how society should act in these cases. You are told, I have been taught, if I were to see a pregnant woman anywhere, I am supposed to try my best to make their life as easy as possible while they're in proximity to me. That includes opening doors. That includes if she drops something, picking that up. That includes literally if she is on a bus with me, I stand up, she sits down. Mm -hmm. That is ink. I don't even have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's beyond my altruism. It's beyond my um, solicitude for that person because I should do that anyway for anybody. Like if I, if I care, like if I see a person struggling, regardless of their natal status, regardless of how they, the who gender, they are, their, like yeah, their gender and their, their, their yeah. genitals, I should care because that's what I want to do. But no, I have been coaxed and conditioned to prioritize particular people and particular statuses. A pregnant white woman, 
protect her with your life. So it goes right back to civility. Who decides it? Who does it benefit? And who does it marginalize? And like I said, we, we all know exactly how that works out. Okay. Do not get angry. If you get angry, they will vilify you. So I am a happy trans. I am a happy trans. I put, I put on a happy face and I put on a tie for all of you for this. Hmm. All of this showcases how, even when standing up, the consistently constantly just views people, even allies, as the ones who are unethical and are causing the problem. Our understanding in this society that we live in today of how healthcare works is just seen as natural and normal. We should be paying all this money just for healthcare. And anyone trying to fight that as an issue is seen as the villain. When all many of us are trying to do is fight hard to not see what little we just have now not get even worse. God, I'm just... I'm just repeating myself, aren't I? I'm just saying the same thing over and over and over again, not just in this video, but every video. I've been making this video, this same video that I'm doing right now for years now. I just, I can't do it anymore. You know what? I'm gonna do something that I know will cheer me up besides eat peanut M&Ms some easy, algorithm-friendly content. Something that everyone loves, right? YouTube response videos. Recently, science YouTuber Sabine Hossenfeld made a video called Is Being Trans a Social Fad Among Teenagers? Which has been heavily criticized by many in the YouTube space for funneling in anti-trans talking points under the guise of being objective. Sabine has garnered herself a long history and reputation on her nearly 900k subscriber YouTube channel for talking about physics and other types of science rationally and objectively, which is what makes her video on trans issues more insidious, because she is often using mis- and disinformation and cherry-picking her responses to push an argument as if it's objective when it's very clearly not when you look at all the details. My fellow YouTubers Rebecca Watson and Ethel Furston have each made their own great videos on this that will go into much greater detail than I will in this video. So I ask that you check out theirs because while I will touch upon some of the things that Sabine has been discussing in this video, I won't be able to touch upon everything. But hey, I'm totally not building up to some larger point in this video beyond just talking about Sabine. I'm, I'm clearly just using this for YouTube algorithm bait. I have no larger point at all. Let's jump in. Should transgender teens transition? This rather personal question occupies a prominent place in the American culture war. On the one side, you have people claiming that it's a socially contagious fad among the brainwashed woke who want to mutilate your innocent children. On the other side, there are those saying that it's saving the lives of minorities who've been forced to stay in the closet for too long. And then there are normal people like you and I who think both sides are crazy and could someone please summarize the facts in simple words, which is what I'm here for. So here, Sabine is acting as the voice of rationality using the middle ground fallacy as her base. The idea that there is some truth between two extreme points. And this is the idea often taken when you hear people discussing issues of rights. It's a very centrist way of understanding arguments about marginalized people's issues. People will frame it as like, yeah, the right is talking about mutilating children, which is probably a very hyperbolic way to talk about trans people, but the left is yelling about a transgender genocide. These things are both really, really ridiculous. And I'm sure the answer is just somewhere in the middle. But this is a fallacy, because the idea that the truth lies somewhere in the middle of two points is not always the truth. Take, for example, if you have someone arguing, Hey, I think we should cut off this guy's two arms. And then that person goes, Uh, fucking no? I don't think we should cut off any arm. I think I should keep both of my goddamn arms and fuck you for saying so. The answer to that problem isn't for someone else, like, I don't know, CNN, to come in and say, well, I think the answer is we, we cut off only one arm and hey, maybe you shouldn't get so angry at that guy for just talking about what he wants to do with your body. It's kind of ridiculous. You're getting hyperbolic and you're getting overly upset. Many of you have expressed deep anger and disappointment. Many of you are upset that someone who attempted to destroy our democracy was invited to sit on a stage in front of a crowd of Republican voters to answer questions and predictably continued to spew lie after lie after lie. And I get it. It was disturbing. But do you think staying in your silo and only listening to people you agree with is going to make that person go away? 
It's also worth noting how Sabine frames herself and the rest of her audience as quote-unquote normal people. And then there are normal people like you and I who think both sides are crazy and could someone please summarize the facts in simple words. But by doing so, she then casts trans people, the ones who are often arguing for trans rights and trans healthcare, as abnormal, as strange, as different. Or in her words, crazy which is an ableist phrase to use, and considering the fact that transgender people are often framed as mentally ill, does raise some major problems with her usage here, especially given that she is framing herself as a scientist talking about medical issues. Keep that phrase in mind, this idea of normalcy, because it is a phrase that we'll be coming back to towards the end of this video. To go back to Sabine, as I said before, numerous studies and research has shown that giving trans kids affirming care not only in decreases the risk of depression and suicidal thoughts in youth under 18, but can be life-changing for them after that, increasing their happiness throughout the entirety of their life and their ability to succeed in life. Yet instead of talking about all of these studies, Sabine only tackles one of them that focused on puberty blockers and HRT and their mental health effects on transgender kids. And she says, Another paper that is often presented by people favoring hormone treatment is one that was published in 2022 in the journal Pediatrics. They followed about 100 young Americans that were either transgender or non-binary, or at least they tried. By the end of the trial, only 64 were left. So we're talking about a really small sample. About two thirds of the participants began a therapy either with puberty blockers or gender affirming hormones during the trial. The remainder served as a control group. The researchers observed 60% lower odds of depression and 73% lower odds of suicidal thoughts among youths who had initiated puberty blockers or hormone therapy compared with those who had not. They saw no effect for anxiety. In case that sounds good, here's the fine print. The mental health of those who were treated did not improve. What happened instead is that the mental health of those who were not treated got worse. And in the end, the untreated control group totaled seven people. I know as a particle physicist, I may be used to unreasonably high standards of statistical significance and sample size, but I'm not impressed. Aren't there any better studies? No, there are not. There are at present no high quality studies that conclusively demonstrate these treatments are beneficial. Now, there are many issues with what Sabine says here. Puberty blockers are not there to fix mental health issues for transgender teens. That's actually a wrong way of understanding what puberty blockers do. What they actually are is just a stopgap that lets potentially transgender kids have more time to decide what they may want to do with their body, and it stops their mental health from decreasing by being forced to go through a puberty that may not align with the body that they may want later in life. So Sabine already isn't even understanding how puberty blockers are being used. Second, seven is a small number, as she said, for sure. But she also ignored that that number was from the 12 month follow-up, not the three and six month ones that had many more people, but shrank by the end of the 12 months as some of the trans kids did go on to get treatments that would disqualify them from the lines of the study as they went on. As that's only ethical, as transgender kids should be able to seek out the care that they need if that's what they should do and not just be held back because they are needed for a study. So for Sabine to cherry pick this one point of the study hasn't really discredited anything. Not to mention that she's ignored the numerous other studies to cherry pick this one study. And Sabine goes on to do this throughout the entirety of her video. And again, I'll direct you to Ethel and Rebecca's videos that go into greater detail. But suffice it to say, Sabine continually cherry picks data throughout the video and ignores the more extensive studies as well as a preponderance of evidence from numerous healthcare groups as well in order to frame her argument dishonestly. And you know what, I, even if I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt and saying that she isn't doing this dishonestly and intentionally, at the very least, it shows a lack of rigor on her part to do the work about an issue that she clearly must know affects a marginalized group very deeply. So it's either dishonest or extremely, extremely negligent to the point of harm to use her 900 k YouTube channel in order to press this information that she very clearly has not done the work on or intentionally not done the work on. Yet, at the same time as she does all of this, Sabine then props up other studies that have been criticized numerous times in order to make her point. Such as, you guessed it, rapid onset gender dysphoria. 
What's more controversial is the question whether the typical age of girls to report gender dysphoria is also changing, and if so, why? In 2018, the American physician Lisa Littman argued in a paper based on survey results among parents that the girls being referred to gender clinics in recent years are different from those of earlier generations. They show an onset of gender dysphoria during adolescence, but without prior symptoms, a combination that was previously basically unheard of. Littmann dubbed it rapid onset of gender dysphoria and suggested that it's a case of social contagion. Adolescent girls get the idea from social media or their peers or both and come to believe they want to be men, hoping it'll improve their lives. Superficially, the hypothesis makes sense. According to data from the World Health Organization, adolescent girls are twice as likely as boys to suffer from mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, so they're more likely to have a problem to solve in the first place. Littman speculates that girls that age are more vulnerable to social contagion than boys, though there's little evidence to back this up. Littmann's paper was strongly criticized for not being a scientific study, but a collection of experience reports from parents. The parents were recruited among frequent visitors to websites who are skeptical that transgender self-identification among teenagers is genuine. This means the sample is unlikely to be representative. Indeed, Littmann herself writes in her paper that it's a descriptive exploratory study. She describes what those parents say. What to conclude from that is a different story. Sabine's framing is entirely off here. As I said before, the blogs that Lightman's study was posted on weren't just questioning trans people or worried about self-ID. They were blogs literally run by gender critical feminists, aka TERF blogs, who were arguing about whether trans people should exist at all. Even if you agree with TERFs, which I don't know why you're this far in this video if you do, but even if you do, the idea that you would go to a TERF blog, groups who have actively campaigned against trans people, and assume you're going to get an objective scientific study around trans people is gross and incompetent at best. Which is why I go back to the idea of believing that Sabine is not just being misinformed, but intentionally dishonest. Because the way she frames these blogs as people who only took issue with self-ID is exactly the same way that many anti-trans groups have also attempted to repeatedly try to frame themselves as. To say, we're just women concerned about trans people and the trans agenda and self-ID laws and how they might uh, just be able to let the angry, dangerous men trying to pretend to be trans is to get into our spaces. Um to show actions, not just words, that they do respect people who believe that sex is real. Mm -hmm. And most of their beneficiaries all around the world, the women uh, who they who they aim to work for, all know that sex is real. The, the things that they should be focusing on, maternal mortality, uh, violence against women and girls, you need to be able to understand that men are men and women are women. In actuality, as I've shown in numerous videos on this channel over and over and over and over again, they're fighting really to push trans people out of spaces because they refuse to acknowledge us as actual women, instead focusing on their particular version of womanhood, which is, hey, surprise, surprise, centered around upper class white womanhood. <laughs> After all, our society, as I've discussed before, makes only a particular type of white upper class womanhood that appeals to the sort of European standards coming out of imperialist and colonialist eras seem like they're the only forms of womanhood that are natural and innate, and everything else is a deviation of. This is often why you'll see many butch women, butch cisgender women who don't align with this idea of the sort of fragile white womanhood also often get harassed by people thinking that they are trans people in a woman's space. But because many of these white feminists benefit from many of the systems, not all, but many of them, it has been made to seem natural to them. Thus, they deny other types of women's womanhood in order to place up their own. Will these women sometimes fight for feminism? Yes, but it is often only white feminism about fighting men specifically in a hierarchical battle, or sometimes trying to place themselves at the top of the hierarchy, not actually dismantling the system of oppression that harms us all. And this is ultimately what Sabine is upholding. We can see this when she frames another paper opposed to Lightman's study in her video. She discusses it to seem like she is giving the appearance of listening to both sides of the debate, but listen to how she discusses the paper that opposes and disproves Lightman's ROGD narrative. 
A paper that came out in August last year claimed to have found evidence for the absence of this rapid onset symptom. However, this paper was also strongly criticized for severe shortcomings, such as, most importantly, for phrasing their survey questions in an ambiguous way and creative methods of interpreting their data. As pointed out by Ethel Thurston, Sabine uses the exact phrase of strongly criticized that she also used to describe the criticisms of Lightman's paper. Thus, she is making these two papers, a Lightman study and the one opposing it, seem as if they were studies that had exactly the same similar problems. But that's actually not the case. The criticisms of that study that was tearing down ROGD have not delegitimized the study as Lightman's was, but instead were ways that fellow scientists have said could be good follow-ups and fixes for future studies on this issue. You know, like how science typically does things by questioning further and improving their methods? Science is all about building up upon what came before in an actual questioning way rather than trying to presume what your answer is going to be before you even start. All of this leads me to ask a question. Given the history of gender outside of our culture today, is there really a fad of kids identifying as transgender? Or is it just a fad of our society to tell kids to be one singular thing that they have been assigned from since birth? To me, it sounds like being able to have multiple gender roles in a society is not the fad. That's just part of human beings' existences. But the fad is trying to tell people that there are only two genders. Maybe a several hundred year old fad, but a fad nonetheless. Ultimately, Sabine's video is just another video pushing many of the same centrist ideas that eventually create the appearance of a middle ground between helping trans people and enabling those who continually cause us harm. Letting people in who feel like they want to be in the middle feel like it's okay to sit back while trans people die because they don't know what's going on or they're too confused and like, oh, maybe it's just a both sides thing. And trans people are dying. I, I... I need something to be able to get through the rest of this video. Let me have a beer because believe me, I fucking need it at this point. God, ah, that's shit. Why in the world would anyone drink this crap? I mean, Technically, the USS Enterprise from Star Trek 2009 is actually an Anheuser-Busch factory, so my Trekkie heart has some affinity for Bud Light, but man, it's it's a bad beer. Yeah, you thought I wasn't going to get a Star Trek reference in here, didn't you? I got it. I always get it. I'm fine without it. You are fine without it. However, the reason that I'm drinking a Bud Light is someone thought trans people would like a Bud Light because Anheuser-Busch paid transgender TikTok celebrity Dylan Mulvaney to do a social media ad appearing with Bud Light to try to convince her mainly trans and other LGBTQ people audience that Bud Light is good, actually. <laughs> Stop it. And all of this is part of an average company's campaign. I've done stuff like this as a YouTuber. I've been paid to use and advertise products in my videos so that my audience may be exposed to it and may find that they like it because I like it. I generally try to only pick things that I know I would like and think that my audience would like, but that is just part of how social media advertising campaigns work. Welcome to our capitalist dystopia. And Mulvaney's post was less than a minute long and mainly about a March giveaway that Bud Light was doing. And apparently this less than one minute ad that happened to feature a transgender person talking to a mainly LGBTQ audience caused a gigantic meltdown. Fuck Bud Light. Fuck but Bud Light's decision to put out a Dylan Mulvaney celebratory can promoting transgenderism and the desecration and appropriation of womanhood has become a tipping point. Grandpa's feeling a little frisky today. Yes, many anti-trans conservatives had a hissy fit that a trans person existed in a space that they felt was exclusively for them. Can't have, can't have the transes drinking, drinking Bud Light, I guess. Grandpa's feeling a little frisky today. Trans people have been so vilified by everything that I've been talking about, the idea that we're mutilating children, that we're grooming kids, that we're speaking up too much, that we're ridiculous, angry, vilified, toxic, making other trans people look bad, sexual perverts, take your pick, when all we're doing is existing and trying to talk about how we're harmed, and yet because of all of that, a single trans person existing, drinking a beer, talking happily, represents all of that to these folks. So many of these people called for a boycott, with even lawmakers doing so. 
If you look at Bud Light, I, I can't think of a time when a company's gone more out of its way to alienate and irritate its customers. It's almost like they've never met an actual Bud Light drinker. All of this was incredibly ironic for numerous reasons. The first of which is that while many right-wing pundits called for a Bud Light boycott, or Budcott, as I'll call it, because why not make a ship name if I can, they didn't realize that Anheuser-Busch is actually a significant funder to Republican causes. We've all seen the backlash that Budweiser is facing over the trans marketing scheme. Is this a one-off colossal screw up or is it something bigger? This could be just the act of one rogue, woke lunatic in a marketing department filled with leftist staffers. The Daily Wire is now reporting that no one at the senior level of Anheuser-Busch was aware of the partnership with Dylan Mulvaney. We looked into the political giving and lobbying history of Anheuser-Busch, and guess what? They actually support Republicans. In, in woke corporate America, Anheuser-Busch supports Republicans. Last cycle, their employees and their PAC gave about 60% to Republicans. This tells us something that we already knew, that big companies aren't really about caring for social issues or rights of trans people or marginalized groups. They just want to sell their product to the most amount of people, trans or not. On the one hand, these groups can have a social media campaign targeting trans people, and on the other hand, send tons of money to the same group of people that are targeting transgender people's rights. So these people to call a boycott of Anheuser-Busch is ironic considering that they then be hurting one of the biggest funders to their own causes. Further, it also showed how ingrained many of these companies are within our giant systems. One boycott supporter, Republican Texas Representative Dan Crenshaw, posted a video of his fridge full of Carbach Brewing Company beer in protest of Bud Light, without realizing that Anheuser-Busch also owns Carbach. Saw Bud Light's stupid ad campaign. So guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna throw out every single Bud Light we've got in the fridge. All right, well, I guess uh, that was easy. So at the end of the day, he was giving money to the same company that he was attempting to boycott. Yet, while I do find that whole entire situation ridiculous, it ultimately shows how much that even trying to escape this system forces us to be unable to do so. We are constantly surrounded at all sides, even if you're being a giant dickhead. So at the end of the day, the Bud Light boycott was potentially profitable for the company because sales of other products that they sell rose. Welcome to our capitalist dystopia. Since these companies are so big, one might boycott one product to just buy another from the same exact company or from another extremely large corporation that does the exact same shitty stuff because, you know, giant corporations are gonna giant, uh, corporate. Does that work? Uh, I'll assume it does. Fuck your grammar rules, society. Grandpa's feeling a little frisky today. And even if these boycotts don't benefit mass corporations, someone with a profit motive benefits, especially in these endless boycotts against wokeness and media. Take how The Daily Wire, for example, launched its own razor company during the boycott of Harry Razors after Harry Razors briefly talked about gender identity issues while they were on The Daily Wire. Yeah, absolutely. So. A year ago today, Harry's Razors, who was an advertiser uh, on The Michael Knowles Show, caught wind that there was uh, uh, some conservatism among our conservative hosts. Michael had said had a conversation with Candace Owens, not even on The Daily Wire, on a PragerU show a year earlier, in which they discussed whether or not gender dysphoria is a mental illness. And a Twitter account that had exactly two followers pointed this out to Harry's, and Harry's immediately, of course, had to virtue signal and say, oh, we had no idea, we're shocked, shocked, I tell you to discover that the people we're paying to help us reach a conservative audience have conservative views. They called those views inexcusable, said that we uh, that there was values misalignment between our two companies, and immediately pulled $80,000 worth of advertising off of Michael's show. And on, at that very moment, I knew we had to launch a razor company. So surprise, surprise, the Daily Wire stoked a fervor against a company that they themselves pushed into that situation to cause a boycott. Then they themselves made their own product in order to benefit from said boycott. Welcome to our capitalist dystopia. You remember when there were two genders and only one and a half of them had to shave their mustaches? Oh, hi, I'm Jeremy Boring. 
CEO and God King of the Daily Wire. It shows you how all of this backlash against wokeness and identity politics or whatever you wish is all about funneling people into more and more isolated insular groups that are cut off from each other and their differences and used to propagate the power in capitalist society symbolized by money and private property of a few who sit at the head of these much smaller groups. And then these smaller groups are made to hate each other more and more because they aren't in community with each other and they don't see each other and they don't acknowledge and understand each other and don't listen to each other. The system constantly pushing us apart and pulling us apart and making that to seem natural and normal. Boycotts and calling for people to not buy products, no matter who uses them, ultimately reinforce a capitalist economy. It forces you to make a choice of buy or not buy, and thinking that by doing one of those two things, you're supporting some sort of cause. I had friends buy me Bud Light, like these are from friends who bought it for me. I didn't go out and buy Bud Light myself, thinking that they were supporting me as a trans person. They're not helping me, they're just sticking me with six cans of Bud Light in my fridge that I'm not going to drink, and they're ultimately giving money to a company that promotes Republicans who are hurting trans people. But because all of this culture war fervor nonsense has gone on, and my friends and other people who wish to be transportive think that they want to be able to do something, they think that buying a Bud Light can ultimately helps me. Ultimately, all we end up doing is just buying products that just ultimately support more and more shitty stuff like, I don't know, chocolate companies that do horrific things in other countries because they happen to have a transgender M&M. Ah! It's the same thing that happens over and over and over again. Same thing with Hogwarts Legacy a few months ago. I argued in my video that the issue with that isn't boycotting Hogwarts Legacy or not. The game sucked anyways, but even if it was the best game any ever, the money still goes to JK Rowling, a person who supports trans harm. But my point that I was making was not that we don't buy the Hogwarts Legacy game as some sort of moral stance. The point that we should take is that not supporting transgender harm is a given. The real issue was to show up for trans people and show trans people that you're willing to be alongside us, to understand the issues. Yet in every article on BuzzFeed, to Bloomberg, or elsewhere, and even my fellow YouTube creators here, the only thing that many heard trans people saying was boycott Star Wars Legacy. And it became this buy or not buy thing and saying, I'm not gonna buy Hogwarts Legacy to stand up for trans people, or I'm going to buy Sta Hogwarts Legacy because uh, screw you. And then anyone who was seen talking about that issue got shoved into one of those two camps, got put into one of these two buckets, even if they were trying to talk more nuancedly about it and seen as villains by the other side over and over and over again, constantly shoved apart, put into separate isolated groups and made to hate the other, knocking us down into smaller and smaller pieces. Meanwhile, marginalized people don't get heard at all. The things that we actually say are never actually listened to. Trans people also, like Dylan Mulvaney, are pushed further and further out of public view for having to face endless waves of harassment over and over and over again. I'm scared. I never expected to have people following me or experience such negative media attention. I walk into a room and I never know if somebody's going to really love me or really hate me. And it's not specifically her. It's numerous trans people who talk about these issues, constantly vilified. And if it's not Dylan Mulvaney in this specific situation with Bud Light, then the next trans person won't get ad deals, or won't be able to be supported or be seen as too, you know, top button of an issue to be able to support us. Too worried about the backlash that they might get if someone like a bigger company like Bud Light gets. We've seen this continually happen recently. Bud Light gave a non-committal apology for simply featuring a trans person in a social media campaign due to all the backlash that they had and fired the people in charge of the campaign that hired Dylan, which is absolutely cowardly and awful, but they're not alone. Even outside of Bud Light, recently the LA Dodgers briefly disinvited the drag group Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence from their LA Pride Night where they had initially intended to honor the sisters after right-wing backlash vilified the group, which in actuality has a long history of doing good work for the LGBTQ community, including its charity work going all the way back to the 1980s and its HIV work. In their response disinviting the sisters, the LA Dodgers said that they supported LGBTQ people, but after all the backlash, they couldn't support the sisters. Basically, they were saying that we'll support the good queers that ultimately uphold the system that harms them and not the, quote, bad ones. Thankfully, the Dodgers invited them back after a lot of queer people pushed back against this, showcasing the importance and power of solidarity within a community. But it is a worrying trend, one also further shown by Target this Pride Month, with that store having removed much of its Pride merchandise or moving it to the back from some stores after anti-trans backlash. 
All of this shows how extremely shallow corporate pride is, just trying to get money from queers that they don't actually intend to support in any meaningful way, and ultimately when push comes to shove, they leave trans and queer people out in the cold. So trans people also get cut off from access to ability to survive in our society. Trans people, over and over and over again, are vilified, attacked, called bullies, and pushed out of spaces that they were once welcomed in. Be it on their favorite Twitch gamer streamer's page, their favorite YouTube creator's page, on their favorite beer company, or wherever. Just like Zoe Zephyr was, just like Dylan Hurt was, just like Dylan Mulvaney was, constantly. Just dehumanized. Not just in the way we're talked about, but in the fact that we're cut off from connection, left alone by ourselves, made to see unworthy of receiving help. And so as we die, as we are killed, as we are attacked, we feel like there is no one there for us. As I was shooting this video, Pride Month began. It's a month that, over the past few years at least, has morphed into a celebration for queer people. A month to show the world that we take pride in our full selves and our ability to exist in a society that often refuses to let us feel any pride because we aren't seen as useful parts of a system that was never built for us in the first place. And we have so much to celebrate, right? We have queer pride in every major city in the United States, and we have corporations selling rainbow merch. I can get rainbow Legos, everybody. Look at this thing. This is, a uh, this is acceptance, right? We can be sold merchandise that reflects us a little bit and make a party once every year in public. Now it's not about us fighting the system. We're a part of it, right? That was, that was the goal all along. But me saying that feels awkward, right? Because we know the truth. It's just a society trying to make us spend what little money it gives us on shallow signifiers of our identity made consumable. Civility. The system not bothering to include us, but just begrudgingly accepting us. Because it can make money. And while most of us have always known this, it's become very clear lately how shallow and conditional that acceptance is. And now that the bigots have been fed red meat, they're looking for more targets because they feel like they can win. They're even targeting Lego now with a boycott. And all feeding the system while doing so. These bigots don't see how this whole system just sets us against each other and dehumanizes us especially those of us the system was built to push aside in order to create a constant cycle of violence and labor to fuel its endless production engines. Make new bricks, just this time rainbow bricks every once in a while. It's the same story again and again and again. The same fight again and again and again. Not just in macrocosm going back through history, but in the microcosm, yearly, monthly, daily, in our lives. I've made videos about rapid onset gender dysphoria over and over and over again, and yet it keeps coming back up. I still have to bring it up in a new video. And at the start of Pride Month this year, the former richest man in the world, Elon Musk, gave a platform to Matt Walsh's What is a Woman documentary on Twitter. Undoubtedly, Twitter is another failing platform caused by Musk's childlike egotistical desire and addiction to being the center of power and conversation constantly, Yet, to do so, to keep that hold on the attention economy, he does so by soaking and promoting hatred and bigotry, by platforming another man from the Daily Wire doing exactly the same, whose film and the rest of his work stokes stochastic terrorism against transgender people and helps fuel the ongoing genocide of trans people. That seems like a big claim, and want me to prove how Matt Walsh does that? Well, guess what? I already did so in this video. And this video, and this video, and this video, and this video, over and over again. And yet he keeps getting promoted because he stokes the flames of hatred to build his own brand, to make money, because that's how the system works. 
When these people have nothing worthwhile left to say, they say the vilest, horrible stuff that feeds the system in the most disgusting way possible because the system itself is failing and needs to affirm itself by feeding itself on the ashes of those it destroys. Like Twitter crumbles, so too does capitalism, and it needs to shove more bodies on the fire to keep running on the fumes. Trans bodies. The same story over and over and over and over again. When One is a Woman started trending again on Twitter, I got tons of Matt Walsh fans coming to my videos on it, his film, and all the comments I got, dozens every hour now, are people saying things like, Oh look, a trans woman talking about Matt Walsh, of course you can't be objective on it. As if a trans woman shouldn't push back against the disinformation our community faces, or the idea that somehow a cis dude is somehow more objective on transgender issues. One of the biggest and most insidious aspects of heteronormativity, patriarchy, and white supremacy is this idea that to be on top of the power hierarchy is somehow making you more objective, and those speaking about or own issues are somehow inherently biased. But then this leads to other comments. How dare you insult Matt Walsh! You're not being civil! This is just ad hominem attacks against him! You have no point! Despite my video being four hours of debunking his point, they don't listen to it. All I hear is people ignoring every single word because it doesn't make sense to their sense of civility and continually focus on the fact that I insulted Matt Walsh's beard in the video. How uncivil I was to him. And you know what sucks the most? Hearing all of that? I wonder if they're right. Not right about all the issues that I discussed, but did I fuck up by insulting his beard? I want so desperately for all of those people to hear me, to hear how Matt Walsh and all this disinformation against trans people is causing us so much irrevocable harm. And it constantly wears me down and, and I don't know how to do that perfectly. And I just want to fight back by explaining with the energy I have. I also want to try and do it with some level of humor, so I added a few jokes about his beard. But was I wrong? Was I the rude one? Was I the terrible person for insulting him? Should I have been more civil? That's the idea that gets in your head because you see all these people missing the point and you wonder, maybe I did fuck up. And I have to endure that feeling all while I'm getting called ableist slurs, told to kill myself, said I'm a pervert, a pedophile, a groomer. But I'm not the one being civil. And it sucks because, you know, sometimes I hate myself. Because I made a joke about Matt Walsh's beard, and I wonder if I failed. I wonder if I wasn't good enough. When I think all that, I then remember what Matt Walsh has done, what all of those anti-trans hate mongers have done, and I feel the anger, and I know that insulting his choice of beard, an actual lifestyle choice that he made, by the way, is the least he should feel. How lucky he is that that's all he feels. How I'm so angry and how he deserves it, I just want to fight back! Pride started as a riot where queer people fought back against cops and laws in a society that refused to let us exist. Not a celebration of what we carved out for ourselves, but a fight to showcase that we refuse to just have to carve anything out anymore. To show that we will fight back! And that anger is righteous and we need to fight back. But that anger makes me look like the bad guy. Because I'm the one pushing back against years, decades, centuries of things being made to seem normal. And that anger takes something from me too. A piece of my soul. And this whole cycle leaves me traumatized frustrated and angry and empty. I feel worn out and worn down. I feel like I've failed on so many fronts that I should have done better, done more, tried harder, been nicer, been angrier, been meaner, been more clear, been perfect in a system that demands perfection of me and yet it would never allow me to be. 
I feel not good enough. I feel like I'm falling apart. Why am I not good enough to save the people who are much more dangerous than me? I have to realize I'm never going to be enough. Because I can't be. Because it's not about just me. As of the time of this recording, the state government in Florida recently attempted to pass bills that would make it illegal to not dress in accordance with your biological sex, and says that to do so is tantamount to child abuse. They have also been trying to pass a bill that would punish child abuse with the death penalty, directly leading to the killing of trans people from one to one. Many states have attempted to also pass bills that will take trans kids away from their parents, cutting them off from their family and their culture, which is quite literally one of the definitions of genocide. Trans healthcare is repeatedly being pulled back, both from kids and adults, leaving trans people dying because we aren't being treated and left to feel alone and hated. And our mental health is deteriorating at a rapid rate. Believe me, I can tell you that from personal experience. Our own existence is being vilified over and over and over and over again whenever we speak up, be it on the floors of our government or when we're talking about stupid fucking video games. Over 100 transgender people, mostly black and indigenous women, have been killed in the US just since the start of the year. And the system doesn't seem to care. Transgender organizer Banco Brown was shot outside of Walgreens in San Francisco by a security guard who accused him of shoplifting. He died shortly thereafter. Brown was a community organizer who continually fought for trans youth, all while dealing with his own issues with homelessness because he was unable to get the support he deserved as a black person, and as a trans person, and as a black trans person, as a person in our society today. Brown was killed just days before Jordan Neely, another unhoused black man who was choked to death on a New York subway, all to the cheers of conservatives everywhere after the fact. The San Francisco District Attorney released Brown's killer, Michael Earl Wayne Anthony, saying that the security guard had acted in self-defense. Self-defense. Murdering a 24-year-old for allegedly taking from a big fucking corporation who didn't give a shit about his life anyways, so that he could feed himself because he was born into a society that created a justification system to deny him his own humanity before he even drew his first breath all while it conspired to ensure his last. That's self-defense. The truth is that his murder, though, was self-defense. It was the system defending itself from those visible by their very existence, their very breath, their refusal to not be pushed aside, their refusal to live by the rules of a game that would never let them win, proving how horrid and disgusting said system is. And it uses the hands of everyday people like that security guard to do so, and then tells them it's okay because that's just how the world works. Fascism often works to make itself seem natural. You'll find words calling back to nature or God or the truth often in fascist arguments, attempting to prove that all these hierarchies that we built in our society are natural and God-given. Men are naturally stronger than women. Trans people are strange and new, something created by Western society. Homosexuality is an abomination of nature. Black people are just inherently less intelligent, more aggressive, more animalistic. It's part of their genes. Yet, all of those statements are all just lies that our society has created in order to justify its power hierarchies, and then lied further about them to make them seem as though that wasn't what it was doing. 
Fascism also stokes economic and sexual anxieties and funnels that exact feeling towards trans people, queer people, and many minorities, or anyone who signifies a threat to the heterosexual monogamous white family unit with its 2.5 kids that fascism and capitalism feeds itself upon. And it dehumanizes who it has to in order to constantly justify endless labor supplies for its death machine to constantly feed and fuel those at the top. All of this is part of the plan. All of this is the goal of rising fascism that takes the ways we built our society to fuel an endless cycle of isolation, loneliness, and cutting off from community, and ultimately death. All to build the power of those already in charge. And anyone who speaks out about these issues, whoever starts to recognize them and speak about them, however imperfectly, however limited in their ability to do so, is vilified. Even by those who think they wish to fight the system itself. Because when everything seems natural, those who speak out and say we don't have to keep recreating this world, they seem unrealistic, unhinged, unreasonable, the bullies for making you uncomfortable, uncivil. So they get cut off, shoved off, lied about, called the bullies, and dehumanized, and their lives are viewed as not worth even a tiny bit of candy from a corporation that never would have noticed it was gone in the first place. What more is there to say at this point? Look at all of my videos over the past few years and everything that I've discussed. I've debunked almost every transphobic rhetoric, tactic, and mis- and disinformation thing out there at least once, if not multiple times. The names may change, and the specific figures may change from Matt Walsh to Kelly J. Keen Mitchell to Abigail Schreier to J.K. Rowling, but the underlying issue consistently stays precisely the same. I could endlessly make the same video over and over and over again, just swapping out the specific names and situations. There will always be new attacks, new bills every day, demeaning the lives of trans people, but they're just the same thing with the new bill number. I have been speaking for years about the issues that trans people face, pointing out where it is headed, and I have not been alone. And we've been trying our best to be open and empathetic to people trying to learn. Everything that I have said in this video is nothing new. Nothing that I have said hasn't been said a dozen upon hundreds upon thousands of times before. But now I do have something new to say. To those of you who I hope have learned, have grown, have gotten something from the things that I have made, what more can I say than now is the time to show up for trans people? This moment is why I spent time trying to explain for this moment, right now. Because all of us have felt the constant drumbeat for years now that has all been building to this. We are nearing the end point, the terminus of anti-trans rhetoric. So now that's the moment to show up. If me explaining all of the things I've explained about trans people and trans rights has moved you at all, has helped you understand why trans people are not only worth protecting and defending, because we are people who deserve to live our lives for ourselves, but also because we enrich you and your experience of humanity and the beauty of society that we all can benefit from and grow from and create something more beautiful out of. If you hear all of that, then you need to know that now is the moment to show up and make that possible. To do it. What more can I say beyond that? What more can I do beyond that? And I mean expressly with this YouTube channel, because there is a lot more to do beyond just saying that. There is what we all can do, and should be doing, and showing up in the real world to do. Show up at protests, make lawmakers who push this horrific shit against trans people uncomfortable and see the harm that they're causing and know that it won't be stood for. Do more than that to them that I can't say on this platform. They can't just diffuse their harm onto a system and wash their hands of culpability because the blood they have on their hands stains and it never comes off. And we need to make them remember that. Fight them. And then also stand in solidarity with other communities fighting their own fights, like abortion rights, black rights, indigenous rights, and more. That is all the work that we can be doing right now, right now. And that is what I'm going to constantly be trying to do. But, in terms of my art, what more do I say? I've been thinking about that a lot. I've been endlessly stuck in a loop of wanting to fight back and wanting to fight forward. 
What do I spend my time on? I'm lucky right now that I'm able to be working on a movie, a piece of art that I hope brings hope. But sometimes as I work on that, I make it and have all the meetings and get to do shot lists and get to work with cool people. Sometimes I feel like in the back of my head that it's a waste of my time when compared to the need to make a video about the next anti-trans bill that is killing trans people right now. Or getting out there and fighting back. And I have people saying that to me on public social media all the time too. Why are you making a video about Star Trek or this or that when a trans genocide is going on? And I understand it. I believe me, I do. But fighting back is a constant Ouroboros that just sucks energy and constantly ends the conversation on their terms. And hope is what we need right now. Because hope is what keeps us going. It's the pool of energy that we draw from. If we don't have hope, then what are we fighting for? What are we aiming for? What, what are we hoping to build? The winning is not the goal. The fight is not the goal. The stopping the trans genocide is not the goal. All things very important and needed and necessary and urgent. But without hope, all that's left is the fight. And the fight is not the point. We fight because we have to, not because we wish to. And so we can't just get stuck in that Ouroboros, but cut the head off that snake and go outside of it. See what we can build outside of the system that makes itself seem natural and normal. Because to get stuck in that fight is just another part of the system reasserting itself. Fuel on the bodies of dead trans people, but then it'll stop one day and just do it again on another 50 to 100 year loop. So what more is there to say? So much more. About hope in the face of the limits of someone else's imagination trying to press us all into a common mold because they can't imagine a world beyond it. To show how we are much more than others imagine us to be. All of us, not just trans people. But I will speak through my trans experience to say that. That humanity is so much more than just what I am the little piece of me stuck in this endless void. I am only a full person. I am only a part of humanity when I am part of something larger. That's what I have left to say. Because there is a universe to explore. I showed you this whole video, how people are left to feel alone, cut off from humanity, but the truth is we have so much community left. There are so many who see through the bullshit and understand that the things that make us human are not only our own individualism, our need to focus on ourselves, but that our humanity is found in the ties that bind us together, in the pull between our bodies as we make something greater. The blood pumping in my veins that you can trace your finger along continues outside of my body and into something much larger than I could ever be. It happens within the system, within Oregon, Washington, and other states passing laws protecting trans health care, or how the amazing Nebraska Senator Michelle Kavanaugh has single-handedly filibustered the Nebraska State Senate for months now to stop them from passing an anti-trans health care bill, talking for over 12 hours a day to keep any bill from moving forward until that one dies like it should. God, a fucking hero, but you see it in so many other ways outside of the system. The hundreds of thousands of people who show up to protest every single day about everything that I have spoken about. The fantastic organizers like Banco Brown who, despite being so little valued by our society and seem to have very little monetary value, actually have so, so much to give that we should feel honored that we get to exist at the same time as them. Activists who constantly show up and fight all of this, who recognize everything that I've said in this video and much more that I and most not even fully understanding it, and understand it not explicitly, but implicitly deep in their souls, because they know the truth of humanity. Fascism and power and control are so weak because it is trying to create something that isn't real. It's using all its power to hide the truth. It tries to make the world seem simple and easy, yet it's lying and it knows it's lying because it has to fuel itself on the anxiety that comes from the realization that is embedded deep within the heart of its system. That it's just figments of someone else's limited imagination. 
Fascism makes that feeling into anxiety that tricks us into thinking we must double down on focusing on the system to work. But in truth, that anxiety doesn't exist because what that anxiety actually is, is us yearning for each other. Us yearning for others to have us as others are there for us. The ties that bind us together are stronger than any that can tear us apart. We just have to realize it. It's what you out there have to realize. To those of you who feel alone, cut off, know that you aren't. We're here together. To everyone else who has the energy, let them know that too. And then get out, organize, find community, fight back against those who can't even fathom the truth strength that you have. Who try to fit you into a box without realizing that no box can ever contain the totality of you because you are all of us together. That's what you're fighting. The fear of the small-minded who can only imagine the most boring possible future. Imagine bigger because we can be bigger. It starts with you now, fighting to expose the truth and make it our reality. Hey everyone. Um, so thank you first and foremost for watching this video. I know, um, I know this is a tough one. This is a tough one for me because a lot of what I'm expressing in this video is just stuff that I have been feeling a lot over these past few weeks, months, years now at this point, unfortunately. Um, it's been really hard being a trans person existing in this world that is, is constantly dehumanizing us and I want to fight back. But I know that fight requires not just fighting back, but fighting forwards. So with that being said, just know that there is hope out there. And I know this video has been tough, but know that there is joy to be found in, in ourselves and what we can create next. And with that said, if you allow me a little bit of the awkward transition and a little bit of self-servingness, I am feeling very lucky lately because I do have projects that are allowing me to do just that. As I shared earlier in this video, I'm currently working on Identities, a sci-fi film being distributed by Nebula. That is a project that I'm just so hopeful for and really excited for. And I want it to be the start of many projects that I get to do like this, not just for me, but all the amazing folks working on it because I want this project to propel every artist that is working on this film forward because the system wasn't built for us, so we build it for ourselves and enable others to build it after us. And that's why I'll just briefly reiterate that by signing up for Nebula at the link below is a great way to do that, not just for me, but all the creators on this project and all of those who come after us. But that being said, I also want to reflect that energy, not just in the films that I'm doing, but here on YouTube with my projects here, because I ain't going anywhere off of YouTube because I love doing YouTube. Now, to be fair, I'm going to be honest between the amount of work that I have to do with identities, again, so many Zoom calls, and the size of the projects that I have coming up here on YouTube, you're probably going to see a slight slowdown in the quantity of my YouTube output, but that's because you're going to see an increase in quality in my YouTube output going forward. Like, for example, I have a video essay coming next month that is going to have a full animated story uh, as well as a full acting cast. And I mean, look at what's on screen right now. It looks pretty baller. And also one that I literally filmed with the Museum of Pop Culture here in Seattle. So it's going to be a big, big video, but it's going to take some time to make sure we do properly. And I've got even more videos coming beyond that, videos that I want to make truly special that are about showcasing joy and fighting forward. But again, to be able to do all of that, I will say that you're going to be slightly fewer videos on my channel and bigger videos. So any support that you can give me over on my Patreon is appreciated. Because Patreon is how I'm able to not only pay my bills, which I like paying my bills, but also the bills of my editor, my animators, and my collaborators on these projects because I want to make sure I am paying my collaborators fairly for the amount of work that they're doing. And if you do sign up on Patreon, you get yourself access to my videos early, you get your name in the credits of the video, and also access to additional content like full interviews that I do for videos like this. So if you wanna hear all the hot gossip that Foreign Man in a Foreign Land and I got into between cuts for this video, you can find that out over on my Patreon. 
But to finalize out, I know, you know, me saying go sign up for Nebula and Patreon is again, you know, self-serving. So I will just say this. I am honored that all of you spent time with me today and I hope that the work I am doing gives you a little bit of joy because all of you give me so much joy just by being in community and, and being just wonderful people who give me even an ounce of your time. And regardless of anything, just know that your existence is appreciated, is loved, and just brings me so much happiness. And I hope that I can give some of that to you. And to reiterate the theme of this video, make sure that you go out and fight for trans people. Not just watching videos, not just, you know, helping me make cool projects and things like that, but go out and fight for trans people out there because there's so much more that we need to do. And know that we are in this together with each other and never lose hope because you all give it to me every day just by existing. All right, now time for my favorite part of every video, and that's to say thank you to all of my patrons who help support me doing what I do. I literally could not make videos at all without your support, so thank you so much. And an extra special thank you to Kathleen Beth, Carrie Allen Foss, Joe Herman Holt, Nils Eisborn, Ids Holm, Lily Gray, Owen Eos, Heather Long, Barbie Ann Rounds, Sarah Montgomery, El Tai Tivi, Cosmic Wave, Jack McAllen, Stephen Kleinard, Hannah Friedrich, Courtney Ray Kelly, Christian Hurst, Michael Walnuts, Jem Shin, Alex Miller, Samuel Howard, Matt Chung, Randy Thompson, Dark Arcon, Chloe Dollar, Super Desi, Baba Rusky, Nisa Mary, Christine S. <gasps> William Tony, Auntie Kate, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Aylin Altman, Britz Krieg, Wellington Marcus, Alicia Stice, Lily Blainley, Jessica Kimberly, Tara Rose, Meadow Whisper, Board and Mary Beth Earl, Vincent Ellington, Angela Hendricks. Whew, need a breath, sorry. Got carried away. Whew. Stephen Coyle, Joelle Gilly, Joseph Dewey, Felicia Tost, Marshall Nye, James Krivda, Zane Schuster, Rose Connolly, Gordon Alexander, Dominic Noble, Zone One Librarian, Jennifer Fust, Weirdy Beardy, Sunk Corgi, Sean McKenzie, Nathan Frotchen, Jolene Cassidy, Sonia Nero Perdo, Ferengito, Transit Toronto, AV, Quattro, Sasha M. Truthsta, Rain Corkin, Ryan Hunter, Lev Goodwin, Scott Russell, Shield Maiden 4444, Teague Wilson. Drew Bach, Dwayne L, Damian Rice, W Randy E D, Carry On, at eh? Stephen Richardson, Jame, John Weatherby, L K, Breachix Purvis, Autumn Jennings, Jade Persuades, Melinda Walters, Nathan Steele, Matthew Craiglo, Kevin Frotek, Jennifer Fronsdale, Maddie H, Lisa, Sean Piper, Sean Sullivan, Flying Kata, Epsilon is greater than Devin Camerla, Casual Observer, Melody Ann, Winter's Good, Mark H Williams, Author, Flynn, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Sarah Bystem, The Mighty Ginger Joe, Michael and Katie Hake. Roy Negby, Patricia Crompton, William Stewart, Blueberry Hill, Jess Johnson, Bob Saget, Emma Ramirez, Katie, Katie K, Sarah Lemero, Laura Demero, Jaffer Day Thomas, Chris Schertz, Becky Sparks, Verdict Sky, Jordy Lucero, Blue, Kurt Mullen, Zoe, Zoe? Joe, Zamil Kincaid, Heresis of Eluitha, Leotha Boyd, Sky Skinner, Troy Stull, Joe Comics, Luna, Valerie Blackford, The Tipsy Changeling, Jason Knott, Joe and the Wrench Witch, Marion Herve, Celestial Dawn, Troy Pertz, Grumpy Dragon 75, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Crit Fax, Zophiel, Strawberry Pup, Adam Ardiel Taylor, Callum McDonald of Clan McConnell, King Gee, It's a Bug, Not a Feature, and Abigail Marie. Adore you all. Thank you for allowing me to mispronounce your names publicly, and mwah.